Welcome back, everyone. Again, I'm Bob Adler. I'm the faculty of the College of Law and affiliated with the Stegner Center. Um, I realize yet another pun of the pandemic Zoomiverse is that we are re-Zooming our uh, symposium, and I don't even get to hear the groans from the audience this way. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, lunch presenter, Briette Van Houten, um, who is a very talented photographer from St. George, Utah. Uh, throughout the symposium this morning, we saw very evocative, sometimes heart-wrenching images of plastics in the environment and what it's doing to our natural world. So we are now going to bring this a bit closer to home um, and um, have a Utah-based photographer um, with a photo essay on what that's done in Utah. Welcome, Briette, and we look forward to your presentation. Hi, thank you so much. Um, like Bob said, my name is Briette Van Houten. I'm down here in sunny St. George, and I am so blessed and so happy to be here presenting my work that I have been working on about for the last year and a half with all of you. Um, so I just wanted to give you all thanks. Thank you for joining us, and I wanted to kind of say thank you to like my husband and my family for joining me on this crazy wild adventure. So um, I really do hope you guys enjoy it. And uh, yeah, here we go. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Briette. It's nice to meet you. I am a local photographer down here in sunny St. George. Um, I specialize in landscapes and I specialize in plastic pollution photography. And so today I just wanted to kind of show everybody in the symposium some of the art that I've created to bring awareness and bring attention to the plastic pollution problem that we've kind of started having. I guess we haven't really started having it, but that we've had over the last several years and um, hopefully these photos can spark a change. And so I'll just hop right to it then. Um, I will have questions and comments at the very end. So let's do it. So this is my plastic pollution presentation. And when I first had originally started this whole project about two years ago, I was out like at a sunny day on the beach with my son and my daughter and we were all just hanging out and playing and as we were playing there was just so much trash everywhere and so I just took a, a quick picture of it and um, at the time I was just a very brand new photographer so as I started evolving this I decided to try and and do something that nobody's ever done before and that was create art with trash so this is my main thing and the the theme is plastic in the natural world and so i will just start showing you my photos what is natural natural by definition is existing in or caused by nature not made by humankind i've googled the plastic ingredients and they should be down at the bottom on this slide most of the plastic ingredients start so the, this is one of the photos that i had taken out on the beach and every every single one of these pictures that I take, I take them as they are. So I don't move anything, nothing is staged. I walk up on the plastic and I just take pictures of it and then I, I pick it up as I go. It's kind of like a fun artsy little cleanup, but in this picture, I was at Quail Lake here in St. George and um, I had come across this tobacco can and I thought, man, that's just a pretty powerful image to see a can that says this product can cause disease and tooth loss sitting in water that our kids play in. And, you know, like fish, they live in this environment. And there's so many other like ecosystems in just this lake. But you don't really pay attention to this until it is killing turtles in the ocean or people are making a big splash about it. It's so easy to turn a blind eye to a can sitting on the beach. What does an infant see with his first conscience glance around the world? He sees a ceiling 
the edges of his crib, and some patches of fabric and walls. Valdemar Mirg. This is a fake, artificial, and plastic world that we create for them. Do we really know what chemicals we're surrounding them with from birth? What's in the food that they feed, we feed them or the clothes that they wear? This picture is a picture that I took of my daughter in her crib. And the reason it was such a big issue is because the plastic bottle in her crib, I tried to buy BPA free. And when she was born, we bought all glass bottles. And even buying glass bottles, it's almost impossible to get away from the amount of plastic we're surrounded by. And this quote comes from a book that I had read not too long ago, and it's called The Ringing Cedars of Russia. Very good book if anybody reads it. And this quote talks about how babies are such a blessing and they have to lower their vibrations to come to earth and to choose their parents and to live here and experience this human life. And we are so blessed to have them. Yet when they're born into this natural world, we surround them with a cage, basically their crib. And in that cage, we give them their milk, you know, their life source, completely marinated in these plastic chemicals that just leach into the milk. And we clothe them in these clothes that are made out of polyester or plastic bits and pieces and everything besides the child that's there has plastic and that was just kind of a powerful image for me that um we can't get away from it and here's another one my daughter and I we went out and did a little photo shoot of her and in this photo session that we had done we um just came across a bunch of of plastic and trash and we found this little sign that says keep out and I thought that it was kind of a cool little sign to to take pictures of but again everything but the the uh, plants and the dirt is plastic you know the plastic from the the paint bottle the teddy bear the uh, mask all of that is plastic and i just kind of thought that this picture would pull a heartstring 450 this is an important number this is how many years that it takes for a water bottle a face mask a baby diaper light plastics like your plastic bags your straws your single a lot of these single use plastics that we just throw away takes 450 years to decompose 450 years that just kind of makes my heart sink a little bit in these pictures they were taken over at red rocks dixie rock here in saint george and i had just happened to come across this baby bird that had unfortunately passed away and laying right next to it of course is a plastic bottle and like i said all of these pictures that i take are taken on site they are not moved or manipulated until after i take the photographs and then i i clean clean up the plastic but um it just kind of really struck me and made me a little bit sick to see that even here in the desert our wildlife is being affected by the trash that we literally just pollute. We just leave it on the ground. We don't realize how long it takes for that single use plastic. And that's really the biggest, the biggest downfall for us is the single use plastic. It's the things that we use one time and we just throw it away. With this slide, I was at Quail Lake again and I had taken quite a few pictures in this photo essay that you'll see here at Quail Lake. And with this one in particular, I couldn't get over how beautiful this landscape was. And the whole point, besides bringing awareness to the art project, was to take a picture that was so beautiful that people would spend like $200 just to buy this landscape photograph and hang it up in their wall besides the one tiny little piece of plastic hidden in the corner or just off to the side. And I wanted it to be so beautiful, but also not at the same time. So this was one of those landscape photographs that I had taken. And I just thought that it was so pretty. It was a gorgeous sky. It was gorgeous water. Yet as I walked along the beach, I could just sit here and pick up trash. But another big reason was that 
we as humans, I've already said this once, but we as humans, we don't care until it's killing turtles in the ocean. We don't care or even acknowledge the fact that we are polluting it because we just throw it away or we did our part because we recycled. But a lot of us don't know or realize that we are throwing these away, are these little pieces of trash or we're recycling and we're doing our part right. Well, a lot of the time, they don't recycle it. So they just take it and they throw it away. It goes right into the exact same landfill as your regular trash. And for a while there, even here in St. George, they would have the two separate bins and they would charge you more every month to pick up your recycling stuff. Well, come to find out they weren't recycling at all. And um, they were actually just throwing it right away and nobody knew about it. And it makes me wonder how many other cities are doing the exact same thing. But it starts it starts here with us. You know, it starts with small changes that we make. And it starts here in the desert. It starts here in the mountains. It starts here in, you know, the mainlands. And it doesn't start polluting the ocean until the very end of the plastic life cycle. And so that's why there's a lot of water-based photographs. Because I wanted to kind of connect the two that there was water and obviously in the water it is a problem in the ocean for the plastic pollution but um it starts here it starts with us it starts in the deserts another here's another photo um that I took it at Quail Lake and my son was just playing of course he's playing amongst a bunch of trash but 450 years that means that that's your great, great, great grandchildren will still be living in the pollution that we create today, still. And as our trash, as our plastic disintegrates after that 450 years, it doesn't go all the way away. It never really goes all the way away. It just gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And then as those chemicals, decompose they leach down into the soil and they leach down into the water and they just become microplastics so 450 years from now our great great grandchildren they may not see the water bottle on the beach or they may not see the fishing line that was left behind but they'll be walking along sandy beaches of microplastics so this photograph i had taken out at pine valley and that's maybe a 45 minute drive from St. George. Of course, here we are with the plastic masks because of, unfortunately, because of COVID, there has been a huge spike in the plastic masks that are found everywhere because they're just discarded. They're just, you know, they blow away or, you know, they, they are just left behind. So the one photograph on the left, I took a picture of in the middle of the road where I found the mask and even I thought that it was interesting that even in the mountains, even like an hour away where you have to, you'll see basically no one and you're still finding things laying around or, or trash that is just left behind. And it, it's just so sad. And once you start opening your eyes and realizing how much pollution we actually have, you can't almost, you almost can't get away from it. So this left photograph was the before. And then the right photograph was the after. It's just crazy, you know. This was another one of the, the photos that I took of my daughter while we were out with that keep out sign. She found a mask and was walking around with the mask. And I just happened to, to find the water bottle laying perfectly and, and we captured the picture. But uh, really makes you think if 100,000 mammals and birds die each year from the plastic we leave behind, like... What are we what are we leaving for them? These kids and these animals, they don't have an option. They don't have a choice in the uh, environment that they live in and the way that they're brought up. They don't get a choice in that. We're the ones who choose for them. I'm not quite sure what we're leaving behind, but this picture was meant to scare because I don't think that we have much longer before we're completely overrun with our trash. I'm just a local photographer. You know, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a I'm not a specialist by any means. 
This was taken at Sand Hollow Lake here in St. George. Uh, you can't quite see the lake, but I had walked just like five five feet away from the lake, and lo and behold, there is plastic, a plastic bag that was actually buried about three feet. So this, this hill goes up about three feet. So it was buried about three feet underground. So I, I took a picture of it and then I unburied the bag. This is a cool little spot that's over by Quail Lake. There's this little stream that feeds the lake. And I took the photograph because of, there was a talkie bag <laughs> laying in the middle of nowhere. And uh, so I, I thought it would be a cool picture to get, get the river and plastic. But according to a study that was done in 2019, the average American eats and or drinks around five grams of microplastics per week. So back to that word I said before, microplastic, that is when the plastic, the big chunks of plastic decompose just enough to become micro. So in your lifetime, that is more than 74,000 microplastic particles going into your body in a year. Bet you guys didn't know that we're actually eating and drinking plastic. And up to 40 pounds of plastic will be consumed in your lifetime. So by the time you're dead, you will have eaten 40 pounds of plastic. It's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? We're feeding this to our children, you know. It's interesting, I read this um, other article about microplastics and being consumed and not only is it because it decomposes and then it gets buried down into the groundwater and then we drink it so our our groundwater is polluted by the plastic but also as those plastics they get smaller and smaller we plant seeds over top of them and then these microplastics grow into the food that we eat carrots are the number one most polluted with the biggest chunks of microplastics that they found as far as vegetables go. And apples were the ones that had the biggest and most polluted fruit. But I wanted to kind of ask people, as you go through your life after the symposium and you start questioning things, I wanted you to like challenge yourself. Go to the grocery store and find one thing that doesn't have plastic in it. One thing. And you'll be shocked. You'll be amazed about the fact that you literally can't find anything. Talk about your fresh fruits and your vegetables. There's plastic of them in them or you put them in a plastic bag. You know, we're not even given the option to move away from plastic because we are literally consumed by it. We are surrounded by it. They're everywhere. It's everywhere. Your strawberries, they come in a plastic container, you know. Utensils are wrapped in plastic. There's even some cucumbers that are wrapped in plastic. You know, canned foods, there's a plastic liner in the can. It's it's pretty incredible that you can't find anything that doesn't have plastic in it. So this one, these two, on the left was a photograph that I had taken of a field. And it was perfect. It was beautiful. The sun was setting. I mean, we have some beautiful, beautiful sunsets here in the desert. And so one, this was one of them. And one of these, this, I think it was a bag of bread the bread bag had gotten wrapped up along this barbed wire fence i snapped a quick picture of that and, and threw it away and then the one on the right was a water bottle that had it was like broken and so i had taken the water bottle and i looked through it with my camera and you can see i don't know i thought it was just a cool a cool angle to see like there is light at the end of the tunnel, you know, we can make a change. So that was kind of where I went with that, that photograph there. But I still thought it was, it was pretty cool. Not that it's cool that we're finding plastic, but it was a cool, a cool picture, I thought. So this was another one at Quail Lake. And this was actually one of the very first pictures that started the project. This one and the tobacco can that you saw in the very beginning, these were two of the very first photographs that I had ever taken of the plastic pollution and kind of making it look artsy and different. Just some fishing line and a, a water bottle cap. But again, it was at a, a really cool time of day where it had just stormed and uh, it was beautiful. It's a beautiful picture, I thought, despite the piece of plastic. So this is the other side of the bag on the left that you had seen earlier. I just got another really cool angle of it. And in the middle, 
is a photograph of my daughter, again, part of the uh, one shoot that I had taken of her, and she was wearing a mask. And I just thought that with COVID being a whole thing that it is now, it would be an interesting photo to kind of show where we're going with life. I think that the masks are going to be a new way of life now. And it kind of makes me sad to see that that my one-year-old won't ever know a life without masks. She won't ever know a life where there is no masks laying around on the ground. And, you know, it wasn't just for recreational purposes or, or medical purposes. They're actually everyday items that we use now. You take your car keys, you take your phone, you take your mask. So I just thought that was going to be kind of a deep picture that that's the new normal. That's the new way of life for her, unfortunately. And then to the right here, it was just, this is a picture of Sand Hollow again. They, Sand Hollow just has some of the prettiest beaches. It's just this deep red sand and the lake is beautiful and it catches some of the most beautiful sunsets. But of course, there's the the party kids that come and, and they leave their ice bags, which is what this photograph was. It was an ice bag that was just left behind. It's just sad to see such a beautiful, beautiful place completely polluted. You know, we live in a place down here in St. George where people come from all over the world to see. Zion National Park being right there, it's a very touristy area, a very popular place. And I mean, it's my hometown. And it was just so interesting seeing how not just from tourists, but just from everyday life, it gets so polluted. And people pay to come and see this stuff. You know, people pay to come here and experience this this area and we don't take care of it. An updated study done in 2020 shows that the United States is one of the biggest producers of plastic. And yet we are only 4% of the world's population. Yet we create 17% of its plastic waste. It's a lot of numbers there where we are such a tiny, tiny portion of the entire globe's population. We create 17% of the plastic here in the United States. Just a shocking, shocking realization. So this photograph, unfortunately, was there was a fire over here by uh, Quail Lake. It was maybe about five minutes away from Quail Lake. And I thought that this was one of my staged photos. I had a plastic bottle that I had just finished drinking. And I thought, how interesting to have water and fire together in a photograph. So that's where this photo came from. Um, all of the charred burnt remains of, of the destruction of a fire and a, a plastic bottle with it. But I just thought that how crazy is it to know that we are doing we're one of the countries that are doing the most damage to the world with the amount of plastic that we create. Almost almost a quarter of the plastic in the whole world is made by us. And that's pretty, you know, that's pretty detrimental. Just as just as bad as this photograph here. You know, so that's why I kind of wanted to show the destruction and and link the two together there. So again, another day day at Quail Lake. I take a lot of pictures at Quail Lake. <laughs> so this one was a, a little bit of a calmer day. And just at sunset, you can see in the background the way that that mountain is just lighting up fire red. It was even more pretty in, in life than the camera could capture. It was just a beautiful, beautiful day. And I was walking along the beach, of course, and found this live bait tub. And of course, as I look down at it, there's the words on the side of the, the little tub saying, please don't litter recycle. Yet here it was sitting in the water, just left behind. And I just thought that it was a cool way for it to be sitting with the background. And unfortunately, yet fortunately for me, being as how this is what I do, I, I can just go out any point in time armed with a camera and a plastic bag and I'll have more than enough content afterwards to share and to show. And, you know, that's it's a really sad thing that that at any point in time I can go out and photograph something in such a beautiful place like this. I just thought it was an interesting picture. At least 50% of the plastic produce is made to be single use. 
and less than 9% of it actually gets recycled. So I had mentioned this before, a lot of the time we think we're doing our part when we throw it away or when we recycle it, you know, I'm, I'm of course guilty of, of using plastic as well, but um, I try to do my part by recycling. And I mean, our, our trash cans are, are crazy. <laughs> There's so much plastic that we put in our recycle bin and less than 9% of what is single use gets recycled. And I don't think that that's necessarily our fault because, you know, that we kind of have to rely on our landfills and our cities to to work with with the, the pollution. But it just it's a shocking number that these single use plastics, they just get thrown away. They just get put in the landfill. And um, I think now here in St. George, they have started recycling it again. Unfortunately, with a lot of the recycling that happens is there's no, there's not very many plants that will accept the plastic that's being recycled and, you know, make to make something out of it or to recycle it. And so what ends up happening is we send all of this trash to to different countries and they just they don't know what to do with it because we pay them to take the trash and you know they just get overrun with it they don't have the the capability to deal with the amount of of trash you know you you see those pictures of people in India and there's another country i can't think of the name of it right now that is just completely overrun with plastic that that people send there because we just don't know what to do with it. We create so much of it, we don't know what to do with it. And so we just send it away, out of sight, out of mind, right? This is a, a plastic bottle. It was the same one, like four pictures back that I was looking through. And there's a couple more pictures of it as we get further along. This is here in Red Cliffs Natural Reserve. This was just happened to be a really pretty day. Me and my husband were out camping, actually, and it started to snow. And they actually do a really, really, really good job at keeping this trail clean. This this whole area, they did a really good, they do a really good job at keeping it clean. And this was actually the only piece of plastic, it was a Band-Aid that I had found on this entire hike. And we were out for a while, but I just thought that it was a really cool picture with the way it was snowing and just the deep red rocks and a Band-Aid. But I'm really impressed with how clean they keep this trail. I was I was quite happy to see that. So the picture on the left is a picture of some fishing line, more fishing line taken at Quail Lake. And it was just a unique perspective. And to the right is a picture of my daughter's feet with a bottle that we found. And if you look close enough at it, on the bottle it says new bottle. And that goes back to the whole single use plastic. If there's any way to get away from the amount of plastic that we use, it is to make less single use plastics, single use. So being able to reuse them. So like your shampoo bottles, if there's a way we could, or get the companies that make the shampoo and conditioner to do like a, I don't know, like a self-serve station where you can bring your shampoo and conditioner bottles back. I mean, I don't know. There's there's so many ideas that that could reduce the amount of plastic that we make. And I just thought that it was so interesting that that it says new bottle and then please recycle right underneath of it. Um, it's just mass produced. This was another interesting photo I took at Sand Hollow here in Hurricane. Uh, this silica gel packet was just buried in the sand and I thought it was an interesting, interesting picture with the waves coming up. And this was one of the first photos I had ever taken. And so please excuse the, the graininess of it and the the poor quality, but it was just a, an interesting picture, I thought. So what legacy will we leave behind for our children and for the animals and for the deserts and for the ocean and, and, and for the natural world? Again, I want to touch on the fact that we don't really take notice of the amount of plastic until it's in the ocean and the wildlife in the ocean is being affected by it, but it starts here. It starts with us. We're the ones that are going to stop it. We're the ones that are going to make the, the changes that need to be made to to reduce the plastic or even make what plastic we do need more natural. Like why why can't we go back to the more natural ingredients of it so that way when it does disintegrate, it's not so toxic. It's not so bad for us and for the environment. 
And so this is just a question I wanted to ask, like, what are we going to leave behind for our children, for our children's children, you know, for the animals that don't get the choice for the environment that they live in? Um, this was a photograph that I had taken of a water bottle that I'd found, and it had been there long enough for some perspiration to happen in the in the water bottle and it was just at the very beginning of a tunnel and so I just thought it was interesting to find this piece of plastic in the most remote area laying the way that it was and uh, just left behind so I just I want to touch on asking what are we going to leave behind we're we going to leave behind the water bottle or are we going to leave behind a world that is actually sustainable that is livable We've only got one world, and uh, I think that it's time that we start taking care of it. This was another photo taken at Quail Lake. This was a tree branch that unfortunately had been burned. It was buried down in the water, and then right underneath of the tree branch, right underneath of this tree branch was the, the plastic that was, it was a plastic bag that was left. It was such a pretty picture until you look close enough and see the plastic that's just floating around in the water. So again, to the left, another photo of Quail Lake. And this one, I found the water bottle, but I had just started playing with these smoke bombs. You know how the everybody has those nice pictures with smoke bombs. So this photo, I had had one of my smoke bombs with me, and I thought, how interesting would it be if I, would, if I played with trash and lit a smoke bomb off? And so I did, and I just it turned out pretty cool. It looks like, like the uh, water bottle's kind of on on blue fire. And then to the right. This is one of our local dumps. And if you don't go to the dump very often, it's a very shocking place to go and see. I mean, just from this photograph, I'm sorry with how harsh the light is with it. Look at how much plastic it was just about to be buried. And this is, like I said before, they don't recycle it. They say that they're recycling it, but it is put in a landfill just like this with all of the rest of your trash. And it's just a very sickening sight. If you ever get the chance to go to one of your local dumps, go and just look and it'll it'll really shock you to see how much we throw away. So this is a, a place called Baker, Baker Reservoir, Reservoir. And that is a, almost to Pine Valley. And I had found a couple cigarette butts. So I, I took this really interesting picture. Cigarette butts I think are, and water bottles are probably one of the most discarded items that you can find. This is it. You know, this is our chance to start making a change and start erasing our footprints. It's amazing. If one person can pick up so much trash, you know, could you imagine what 50 of us could do or what 100 of us could do? And there's a lot of nonprofit organizations that are starting to to come around now that do local cleanups, that do, you know, local pickups. And that's the next step for me is to start working with some of these nonprofits, one of which is Love Where You Live, Utah. I'll give them a shout out. They're really, really great. It's this is our time to, you know, start erasing the footprints before it gets to a point that we're unsustainable anymore. Have you ever seen the movie Wally? -E? I feel like that is where we are going to be in maybe 50 years if we keep up the way that we're going. Right now, it's just a little piece here and a little piece there. What happens in 50 years when we've overpopulated the earth and overpolluted the earth and not enough people took a stand and made a change? So that was where my whole motive, motivational speech comes from is, you know, I want to encourage people and inspire people to band together to start making a change. And um, those are next steps for me is starting to have host more cleanup. If anybody wants to join, feel free to find me on social media. I'll do local cleanups and uh, start working with some nonprofits to change the world. These are some of the references. And I believe that you will be able to find these or be able to, to click on them later. But these are just some of the references that I was able to find um, and get my facts from. So in ending, um, like I said before, you can find me on social media if you want to join me in any of these adventures. Um, and on this last slide, you'll see the references that I was able to find online. Um, 
you should be able to click on all of those links. Um, and, you know, I really inspire you all to to join with me and band with me to to make a change. You know, we've we've got one world and and it's just us to take care of it. So. Let's do it, you know, join, join me, watch me or join me. I don't know. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a good, good thing. Thank you very much, Bree. Um, beautiful images, powerful message, um, which is a great combination. Um, and I neglected to um, mention again that if you have a question for Bree, um, click the Q&A icon at the bottom and type in your question. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions. There were two questions. They seem to have disappeared. Um, one was where people can find your work, but I think you answered on that mm -hmm. question. Um, I will ask you, what other outlets um, have you had for your work? Who else has seen it? And what do you think the impact has been? What have their reactions been? Well, thanks again. Um, a lot of the places that I've advertised it is on Facebook and on Instagram. It's usually, I usually go to Instagram first. Um, everybody that I, that has seen it has just had positive feedback. And um, there's a couple of nonprofits that I would like to work with eventually um, to share my art there as well as on my website. Um, a couple of them, like I said in my speech, was Love Where You Live, Utah. They do incredible work. Um, and they're going to be showing a lot of my photos on their website, as well as a friend of mine, Spencer Bowler. He is doing a lot of cleanups up in Salt Lake. And you can follow him on Less Than Wasted on Instagram as well. But a lot of these guys, you know, they, they come together and they just, I'm just, you know, taking the pictures. <laughs> so... Okay, have you heard of the literati? No, I have not yet. But I would like to learn more. <laughs> well, there's a link here, www.literati.org. So apparently it's um, relevant. Could you talk a bit more about future photography projects you plan on doing on the subject and what geographic areas you plan on focusing on? Yes, absolutely. So, um, Next for me, uh, I've done a lot of work here in Southern Utah. I'd like to start mo moving north, Northern Utah, taking a lot of photos there and working with a lot more nonprofits up there. Um, eventually, I would like to possibly start selling photographs that are made with plastic and um, donating a portion of that to some of these nonprofits to give them a, like some sort of income to not only spread a message, but to, you know, have income to, to be able to afford the work that they're doing. So that's kind of what's next for me. Um, as soon as I get done with Utah, I'm just going to move on to the rest of the world, one picture at a time. So this is um, maybe a strange question, but your daughter is a bit young. Um, mm -hmm. Son seemed a little bit older. Um, yes. I'm curious how much he knows and understands about what you're doing. And if, if you were to have given him two minutes um, or so to add to your presentation, what might he have said about it? Yeah, he, um, he knows that it's dirty and that it's, that it's trash. But um, explaining that to a seven-year-old is kind of, you know, a hard thing to do being how he, he doesn't quite understand the magnitude of how big it is. He just knows that we're going out and we're taking cool pictures of him and we're picking up trash while we do it. So um, that's probably what he would say. <laughs> he just likes his photos being taken. And, um, and I tell him that we're doing something good while, we, while we're doing that. Good for you. Um, start education really young. Um, yeah. Have you considered also doing work in video art or filmmaking um, as related media for your messages in this area? Yeah, I would like to eventually um, because I think that that's where photography is going. Eventually, I feel like in maybe the next 50 or 60 years, we won't have still pictures. We'll have like moving pictures. And and so I think that video is going to be the next step. Um, 
but that's kind of a little bit further down the line for me. That'll be either hiring somebody to go with me and help me with that process because I'm just a one man team here. So. Okay. What other artists work have most influenced your own when it comes to this area of your work? Um, you know, I don't follow a whole lot of artists. There's, you know, it, it all kind of just started that I liked taking pictures. So, um, you know, just seeing really cool things in magazines and, and I just liked the way that, that I, I took them. And so there wasn't a whole lot of artists that I'm following yet, but I do know that there is a lot of people out there that I would like to get in contact with and that I would like to join with and, and see their pictures as well. And hopefully maybe change the world with them. Have you found anything helpful in keeping Utah State parks cleaner? We live in Utah, exclamation point. Yeah, so no, um, not anything besides just the, the nonprofits that are just barely starting. There's not a whole lot of nonprofits, especially for the mainlands because most people are worried about the oceans. So as these nonprofits come up, I would like to join with them and band with them. But um, right now it's just local cleanups that that go out and maybe I will start working with the national parks to see if they would like to, to get together and, and photograph cleanups there. So um, on the literati um, issue, um, someone posted um, geotagging litter, almost 10 million pieces collected. Um, and then it's www.literati.org backslash how it works. Um, so if you're interested in that, um, sounds like an interesting project. Oh, wonderful. Yes, I will definitely look into that. So thank you so much, Robert, for that, that information. I appreciate that. Okay, well, thank you again for a wonderful presentation. Thank We're really you. For taking the time uh, to be here. Um, we are now going to go into another break for about 15 minutes. We'll come back um, at 1.15. Um, for our panel on plastics and the environment, which will be moderated by my colleague, Heather Tanana. Have a good right, break. Thank you so much. Thank you bye bye. Again.